Hello and welcome to uh, Denise Guarda YouTube podcast show powered by openbusinesscouncil.org and citiesabc.com. We keep profiling global personalities, thinkers, and uh, I would say the doers that think out of the box and actually want to bring new energy, new experiences to the world. And uh, today I'm quite excited to talk with, uh, I would say, is the first person on the show coming from Qatar. And uh, I'm quite excited as well to talk about the lifestyle in Qatar, the life the and the different things. In this show, we've been always profiling people that create new cutting edge businesses or technologies, and as well, people that actually normally create new narratives around what they're doing, their communities, their ecosystems. So without further delay, I want to, to welcome to our series, Mirage M. Kuresh. And uh, Mirage is, uh, I would say, a fantastic, full of energy personality that is a Qatar-based entrepreneur and the founder of 365 Adventures. An adventure himself, uh, Mirage established 365 Adventures to connect travelers with local guides, tour operators, and experts who can provide authentic experience throughout Arabia and Middle East. The core value of uh, 360 Adventures is immersive visitors in the culture, heritage, and transformative experience that the Arabian Peninsula has to offer. Mirage uh, M. Kuresh has always been linked to the experience and tourism. He started his career in 2013 as a project manager at Qatar Lifestyle Guide, uh, 7A Arc and 7A, uh, moving to entrepreneurship right after that. He then co-founded Imandobo, Mandoop, which I'm going to be talking as well, an online platform that connects with the best pro service providers in the country, which is still active today. Initially involved in athletics, particular uh, beach volleyball with the national team of Qatar, Mirage transitioned to become a proficient in professional dune bashing, paddling instruction, kite surfing. Uh, he's also an instructor and advanced open water scuba diving and further gliding. And Mirage holds a higher national diploma in business management from the British Center of Applied Studies and a higher national diploma in business management, marketing and related sports, uh, support services and at Excel. So welcome to our series, Miral. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Denis, uh, for the opportunity. <clears throat> um, so I think. Um, we go with our early life. Um, I was uh, born in uh, 1993, uh, about 30 years now. And my grandfather went to Qatar. And um, actually, I like to say Qatar because I'm born there. And I always tell people, you know, the French people don't call France, France. So it's Qatar. Uh, the grandfather went in 1950s and then he decided to just stay there. My father was a very young entrepreneur. Um, he started his uh, business, I think, at 19 years old. And um, up to 2006, everything looked normal for the conventional entrepreneurs. Uh, he was into very uh, traditional business, which was just repairing cars. At that time, he owned half of the street with uh, shops on both sides. And then, of course, in 2006, uh, the Asian Games took place. At that time, I was about 13 years old. That was the first ever international uh, sporting event that took place in Qatar. <clears throat> After that, um, the father was not very lenient towards entrepreneurship because um, in 2006, what started happening is that new entities started coming uh, into the country and my father wasn't making the same money as he did before. Uh, majority of the money um, from the background that I come from. So yes, I'm born and raised in Qatar, um, but originally I'm from Pakistan. And of course, my father is born in Pakistan. So he brings those values with him to where I am. And he sends back majority of the money. So <clears throat> studying was a deal breaker for me. And it didn't quite take place as I anticipated. Um I think I would I think I would like to say that I was a born entrepreneur. I always wanted to have like a laid out schedule, um, you know, start whatever time, finish whatever time. I, I like to be busy throughout the day. 
it became to a point that the days we would not have work, I would start getting depressed and like, okay, maybe I'm not good enough. But of course, they are up and down every time. And, you know, there were a lot of freelancing jobs. Um, that's how I came up with the first uh, healthy lifestyle guide uh, program as well. Um, at the age, I think I was less than 21. And I wanted to kind of, I was into gymming so much. Uh, as I was a national team uh, volleyball player as well, um, indoor and outdoor. Outdoor is beach, basically. At that time, my career was mainly into uh, volleyball sports. You know, I was a very, very good uh, uh, sports person. The issue was that because I didn't have nationality, citizenship, they were paying me less than $1,000 for my presence to be there. While there were people coming from outside, same level, they were getting four times, five times, six times high, you know, so there were no benefits. I said, okay, here, I don't have any future as well. Now let's start looking into different uh, different places. And uh, <clears throat> I came up with the, the Healthy Lifestyle Guide. Um, it didn't go as I wished, you know, and there were a lot of um, hurdles. And of course, it didn't put me down. I was I always wanted to be a guide. So remember the Lifestyle Guide? Yeah, I, I didn't leave the guide part of it. I became a tour guide. <laughs> you know? So going from a health guide to a tour guide. And I said, you know, there's a lot to do in Qatar, but nothing is online. Maybe it'd be a good idea to create something online. And, you know, it's a pretty common story. You would, you would hear everywhere. Like, there was, it wasn't there, and I created it. But what's special? The special was something else, you know? The vision was different. It wasn't just me. I wanted to establish an entity, an organization. And uh, in, uh, so we started... Uh, you know, uh, in, in w w not legally, you can say like it was a freelance work, you know, uh, build a little bit audience here and there. And I ended up uh, traveling to America in 2015. That was my one of my first traveler uh, traveling experience. But I realized how good of a traveler I am, because in 40 days, I did 15 states by road. So one, five states. And I did 35 cities, which I visited. I visited different places, took different experiences. It was a total different experience for me. Well, it was a very big eye opener. Uh, how did it start? So it did start with uh, me taking people, you know, on the desert trips and exploring different areas in Qatar. Although Qatar is so small, you know, it's 11,500 square kilometers, but it's actually smaller than that, in my opinion. We only have... <clears throat> a few areas in, in the country if you really want to do something outdoors. So commercially, I will never make money. I will make money as a solo person only six months of the year because six months of the year is when it's good weather. I had to come up with so many different ideas. You know, I'm like, okay, can we do something with schools? What are the schools doing, uh, doing during summer? Oh, maybe we can use the school campuses in the night. We're bringing all ideas in the world, you know, <laughs> down to the table like, we have to somehow make it work because it wasn't working. Yes, we never made uh, losses. That's because we weren't taking salaries. And so all the, the, the direct costs were always below the sales amount. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we spent one season and the second season comes in and boom, 300% growth. Amazing. It was so nice. We were everywhere. In the second year, when I used to go receive the guests, they used to say, I mean, they used to ask me this question, who is the owner of the company? Said, uh, well, you're talking to one of them. Said, oh my God, so we're meeting with the owner. And said, yeah, what's the, is, is that a problem? And she said, no, it's just that I thought you guys are such a big company. And I said, why do you think, so? why do you think that? She said, you're across social media everywhere. You're on every corporate discount. You're, there's, not a, there's not a place we haven't booked. I mean, we haven't seen your name. And that was the strategy. That was something that we didn't even <clears throat> think of it as a, I mean, as something you, you would call a challenge. It was so nice. For example, like we meet with someone, we're like, do you have something that your guest can book or something? Okay, we have a platform. For, fine, put us there. There were events pages. We just kept uploading events there. Our events were unique. Unique in a sense that if you go to the desert, you need to do something. So the first event we did was full moon, uh, yoga, and desert safari. It was so nice. So you go to the desert, and then you do uh, during the full moon, and then you offer a yoga session. 
followed by barbecue skewers. People loved it, okay? Every time we'd do an event, it would get full, fully sold out. Then we did Dow Cruise, but Zumba on, a, on an island. A Red Bull came and said, we will sponsor your music, we'll sponsor the boat for you, and we'll sponsor the, the Red Bulls for you. We just want a nice video. That was so nice, okay? We did, uh, then, then um, uh, I, th there is something that is really, really nice. It's called uh, the Friday show, yeah? So it's called the Friday celebration. During winters, from October to April, thousands of people gather in the desert. It's an insane scenery. You see it, you're going to get goosebumps. You'll be like, all of these people, 250, uh, 25 kilometers inside the desert, no roads, nothing. Cars are following each other. That was an adventure on its own. We decided to sell it as, a, as an experience. I called it Extreme Desert Show. It was only available on Friday. Every single week, we would have 100 plus people only, you know, because they heard about it. There were reviews. There were blogs about it. People were sharing stories. They said, you need to go to Qatar. There's crazy things happening there. It was coming a reality. We wanted to, you know, we, were, we wanted to promote the destination as, as a crazy place. So uh, for people listening like me, that I'm in London, that I'm European, I don't have a lot of knowledge about Qatar. So you touch a lot of different things. Of course, there's your background and your family, and then there's Qatar. So uh, tell us a bit about the country first, because I think for our audience and for people that never heard, of course, you are right now telling us about your company and the cool stuff you do there. And I want to yeah, touch yeah, that, yeah. but let, let's start first with Qatar, because Remember that, uh, like you said, people know Qatar by being a very wealthy country because of the oil. And second, because of probably the football and some of the sports events that have been happening the there. World Cup. Uh, so tell us a bit of uh, what is there, because you, you grew up there, you are there. And of course, you have your fantastic experience. And of course, uh, um, whatever you want to share. But I'd like to have that overview about your generation, the people that you deal with doing business there, entertainment and these things. Because I think that's the thing, because people that are, even people that go to a sports event there, probably they'll go for an agency and just follow the stuff. So I would like to hear a bit of the old background as a local. Correct, yeah. Well, look, um, <clears throat> I grew up in Doha uh, in two environments. You know, one was the the Pakistani community that I was, that was you know, I was, I was studying with them. The second was where I was playing in the club, where, which was 90% Qatari. So I grew up in both, you know, so I took from both. That's why my pronunciation tend to be very much like Arabs, you know, and I can also speak very good my own languages, you know, although I, uh, the, the best language I have right now is English because of the people I work around. So <clears throat> let's say before 2006, um, 2006 is a very uh, good bar that we have created. Uh, it's, you can create a frame and you can put 2006 here and then anything above that is old Doha and anything ahead of that is new Doha. And 2006 above, uh, uh, <clears throat> like uh, ago, I would say that uh, life was very different in Doha. Very nice, actually. I, I didn't like the life uh, in, uh, in Doha post, I think, 2018 onwards. It wasn't the same anymore. But 2006 uh, before, it was what was different. Um, I had friends, we were going out in the streets, okay? I remember that it was July, August, and we're just chilling out in the streets, I swear. You can't do that anymore because now you know the weather is hot. Back then, I didn't know the weather was hot. <laughs> it was still the same weather, but I didn't know it. Who told us? The people that came from outside, I'm like, my God, this is so hot. We didn't know that snow existed. Okay, there was TV, yes, but we thought snow only exists in, you know, mountains and all I didn't know snow exists in the cities. <laughs> you know, the weather was, um, weather has been a central talk in the country always, you know, is that six, seven months of the year, you meet the happiest people on the planet. And then the four or five months of the year, <laughs> you don't meet the happiest people anymore. The weather really, really affects everything. That's I mean, amazing. And this, this yeah. kind of uh, experience are for for outsiders that of course uh, we listen a lot of stories and of course the innovation coming out of qatar and saudi are, are explosive right now so let's talk about your company so you mentioned um 
all the events you've been doing, how you created it. And it's really amazing what you did as an entrepreneur with the hustle, but as well with the other parts. So um, your company, so you are still with Canada, with Qatar. So a bit of context of the company, how it works and what it offers. Uh, well, okay. So the, the company is based in uh, four different uh, countries right now, two virtually and uh, two physically. Uh, Doha is the headquarter and Dubai is the branch office. Okay. Uh, Oman, we are virtually there. And in Saudi, we are virtually there, but we are uh, we are in the process to create a company. I would like to uh, move slowly the base of the company to Riyadh. Riyadh is very nice. Okay. What we offer is a solution, you know, it's called arrival to departure solution. So you come to the airport, from the airport, back to the airport, anything's in bet- anything in between, we take care of that. Now you're talking about anything that comes in between, except oxygen, because that's available for free. <laughs> talking about SIM cards, talking about mobility, logistics, accommodation, restaurants, events management, anything. Now, an events, uh, sorry, a DMC, which we uh, tend to be, destination management company, they usually have this uh, privilege or, um, yeah, I would call it privilege of being a trustworthy partner in the destination. So we are the destination uh, geniuses, you know? You come to us and then you tell us all your problems and we will sort it out for you. So we then contracted to different, different companies, you know, events management company, sound management company, uh, transfer, transportation companies, accommodations. Yeah, we, we have basically everything. So I think you get the full idea. Basically, in, in order to, in, in, to summarize it, it's A to D, arrival to departure. So that's uh, that's amazing, and uh, I I like these things because uh, traveling is one of my passions, and that's why we're talking here about. So let me touch right now in terms of um, the first of all the Imandub, and uh, first of all what is a Mandub and why you create Imandub? Because, uh, <laughs> it's a great concept, and I like to touch that. Awesome, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, earlier um, in 2019, before the COVID happened. Uh, Imandu was born out of a necessity. Yeah? Uh, for 365 Adventures, we wanted to scale up. But because it's a physical business, it was very hard to scale up. You know, we have to hire a lot of people to scale it up. How can you scale up a business without hiring a lot of people? You bring technology into the into the picture. So as soon as uh, people started talking about technology, I started and it's possible and try to get a solution that will connect buyers with the supplier seamlessly so that, you know, if I'm dealing with 10 buyers now, I can deal with 10,000 buyers now without interfering. This is something I was looking into. And then, of course, COVID happened, right? I was almost ready with uh, Oleg, um, you know, our mutual friend. I said, okay, this is the, the scope of work I have. I need the quotation for this, and this is how I want to do it. Oleg told me already, this is going to cost you thousands and probably millions okay because what you have given is is a is a solution for for the whole travel industry you know and um when i was talking to big companies you know i I will mention the likes juniper is a very very big company in the in the erp and the travel solutions they couldn't understand my request and covid happened and we were all sitting on our tables with not receiving emails not receiving anything except cancellations so we're like okay and it went on for a few weeks for a few months and i decided okay you know what we have to do something in the meantime because i don't know how long this covid is going to have uh, is going to is going to be there for and i was very good with one thing that is my credibility in doha is very strong in terms of legality yeah people ask me i have a very good very big community around me professional community i came up with a very bulletproof system took a lot of time took a lot of understanding and as soon as we were ready to launch, boom, I found a problem. <laughs> the problem was there were so many spelling mistakes in the in the website. And I said, okay, I'm not going to go ahead with this. So it took me six months to eliminate the spelling mistakes because the spelling mistakes were all, spelling mistakes were all in hidden places. They were in warnings. They were in um, cautions, whatever you can think of. And... Once the spelling mistakes were eliminated, the PROs were ready. We started to do the marketing. I think we did it for a month. 
and boom. 2021, November, we make record sales in 365 Adventures. We made so much sales that the team did not have time anymore to answer our calls. Uh, you know, they, they didn't have time to answer calls anymore, like of each other, actually, like internal calls. Like they're not calling me anymore. They're just sending, please send this, please send this, please send this. And the government started working with us. It was so nice. 14. I felt like I'm in the best industry in my life. You know, I'm making 50% margins on everything, 50% on average. So beautiful, you know, it was the most beautiful business you can imagine. Just on that level. So from, from experience of your growth of business to the experience. So this was partly because Qatar promotion worldwide because of, uh, of uh, the, the, the World Cup. Of, or was it just because Qatar yeah. start being on the news and start being the hype? No, 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 no. Majority was all B two B. Actually, it was all B two B from government. Government, all government just wanted three six five adventure. So I had to dump Iman Loop. I'm like Iman Loop, you, you wait, okay? You, I will touch you after the World Cup, and um, and then of course all the focus shifted towards three six five adventures because there was no one else to work on Iman Loop, and it was very hard. It was very hard to find time to even complete the 365 ventures work. All government, all ministries, all authorities wanted to work with us. They somehow, I don't know what happened. It was like, I'm not kidding. In a day, we got 100,000 worth of business confirmed. In a day, that was unbelievable to me, you know? I was thinking, well, what happened? Did someone did this application for me? It was unbelievable, honestly, you know, a company that started from zero investment. I never invested anything in 365 Adventures when we started. The, the marketing that we did for the events that we used to operate were on credit from Facebook. So we would put, you know, $150 as a, as a budget, but then we would do the event and then we would get charged for the marketing budget. So the money was coming from the event. Like I didn't have to put anything. I don't recall a day where I had to put anything from my pocket. And uh, yeah, so yeah, well, yeah. Qatar did a lot of promotions and it was good for us, yes. Oh, that's amazing. So coming back to the Iman yeah. Loop and uh, what you're doing right now on the next stage, uh, we are closing to one hour. So I, I want to, so you, you you created something, like you said, from scratch. You are as well a talent from Qatar. I know that it's interesting to see the, the nuances of society of Qatar. And, and of course, I think, like you said, all Middle East complications, uh, which uh, for people from outside, there's a lot of stereotypes and a lot of things. And I think you touch a lot of important things, like from your personal experience with your father, the heritage between Pakistan, Qatar, and even <laughs> Qatar, you have to go through. So it's really quite complex. And, and that, I think this doesn't pass to the rest of the world. And that's why I love these interviews, because I learned so much and and I, I could knowledge myself. And and, uh, and I think we always we can always get out of our comfort zones. And sometimes people have these problems. So one, one question I have. So now that you are having the maturity of uh, uh, the company and well, the two companies in the end of the day, because we have Imandip um, and as well the travel uh, 360. 365, so, yeah. 365. So how are you going to right now, what's your goals? How do you see the rest of the things and take it forth? So um, 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 for Imandip, I have found uh, a few potential uh, Partners, I want, I want very, very, uh, I think I explained to you last time as well, you know, I'm not convinced with partnerships, you know, I need a partner that will challenge me. I don't usually come across these partners. They have to be better than me, you know, and they usually come with the, the common things that, you know, any entrepreneur would say. I don't like um, these common things to be told uh, majority of the time. So for Iman Dub, I'm looking for very, very, um, qualified partners and funding as well. Like I'm looking for funding. It has great potential. Uh, I estimated more than hundred million dollar worth of business, you know, and revenues easily in that, in that, uh, in that platform, if connected with the government, it can become a unicorn. And I can promise you on that, you know, because government is doing more than a billion dollars worth of transactions, probably in every 30 days or 15 days. You know, and you're talking about the whole region having this problem. It's a necess it's it's almost a necessity. Anything with necessity solution tend to do good. 
for 365 Adventures, we're focused a lot more on the ERP now that we uh, work that we're working with our partner Oleg. That ERP is going to be a game changer for the whole. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to say world. That would be too much. But it's going to be a game changer for the region. It will eliminate all hurdles. It will make so many problems so easy. Um, there would be no competition for it. Uh, it's it's imaginary, you know. If you're in travel industry and I tell you what it's going to be, you're going to be shocked at how did these ideas even come to the table. To the point that I've actually given these ideas to the tech companies, you know. I say, I want this. And they said, no, I cannot do it. Fine, if you can't do it, Oleg said, yes, I can do it. And said, okay, if you can do it, Oleg, you know, this this is going to be a game changer in the industry. So these are the two areas that I would like to develop. And the regions uh, are especially, you know, I would say Saudi. Saudi is for me. Saudi for me is is the best uh, place to be right now. And one question I have for you on that. So you touch investment and you touch growth. And you said, I understand because, of course, there's a, I think one of the things you guys did over there, and when I say you guys, it's all the context of Qatar special in Middle East, um, but uh, from Dubai to uh, first Qatar, now um, Saudi, that's effectively a massive Martin, I would say Mar- Martin powerhouse, because you guys really managed to put these countries having more attraction than France or Spain, especially because there's a dynamic and young people, and of course, the weather is always great. So, and a lot of people want exotic locations. And of course, there's political stability and a lot of other things. But from a startup life, so you, you mentioned your challenge as an entrepreneur. I know that uh, uh, Qatar is slightly different from Saudi. Saudi is really a lot of money and is a bigger country than Qatar in terms of size. I'm not talking about in terms of money. But how is it is, uh, for, for instance, you mentioned that there's things with the government, there's international, for instance, uh, companies that are coming or international uh, VCs, accelerators. Is there anything like that, like you have in in, in the UK and the US and in Europe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so look, um, Doha t- tend to be uh, tend to rank the lowest amongst the Middle Eastern countries, not even GCC, Middle Eastern countries. So you have countries like Jordan that ranks above Doha, and Jordan is quite a uh, it's not as rich as Doha, you know. Uh, Dubai is the best in the in the region. They invest. They have a very good ecosystem. They have VCs. They have private investors. They have they have huge networking um, um, channels. Let's say yeah. The Saudi is the next one. So, of course, they're going to beat Dubai, 100% sure. In terms of uh, spending money, Saudi is going to beat it. In terms of results, um, don't hold me against it. I hope Saudi beats them because they're going to spend more money. But Dubai tends to be more serious, you know. They have more talent. They have, they're have they more acceptable to international community. So, you know, you get my point. Like, Saudi is more focused on local talents. You know, local talents will will, will need time to, to reach the international um uh, uh, the the market internationally is huge, you know, and so you have best of the people coming to the to to the to Dubai basically, yeah. From um, Riyadh perspective, and how you as an entrepreneur with a global right right now network because you have uh, Qatar, Pakistan origin, now Canada as well, and now from <laughs> Qatar to and you're doing as well a lot of things in the region, not just in Qatar. You're doing Bahrain and a couple of other countries. So tell us a bit about this and Riyadh. Yeah. So, so Canada is off of the list because it didn't happen. Uh, 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 the team is based in five, con- uh, four continents in total. Uh, so it's not all in Doha. Uh, you will learn the name Mandu very, very well once you come to Middle East. <laughs> Don't worry about it once you settle here because you would need it uh, uh, on daily basis. Uh, Riyadh is amazing. Uh, I think it's the most real city in the Middle East or in the GCC you can come across. There is rich people, there is ultra rich people, there is um, middle class, a huge population of middle class people, and there is also poor people. There are new cars there, there are rich cars there, there are amazing cars there, there are broken cars there. There is all sort of things that you will come across. There is amazing bazaars there. Beautiful place, you know, the color of the city is amazing. It's all reddish. It's only yellowish light, so it's always very dim. I love it. There's no discrimination. For some reason, I don't know why there is no discrimination. Uh, Everybody is pretty much the same. If you speak Arabic, people are never going to ask you where you're from, regardless of your accents, dialect, whatever it is. Uh, 
the, there's a lot of hardworking people in Riyadh as compared to Dubai and Doha. I think Dubai and Doha locals don't work in the businesses that Riyadh people, uh, sorry, Saudi people work in their in their businesses. Uh, locals are very, very it, locals are everywhere in uh, in Saudi. You know, so it's amazing. You'll see uh, the white tobe across the whole country. Even the expats wear the white tobe sometimes. You know, and even the women. They were on top, Abaya. So it's so nice. It's like penguins, you know? You see white and black in the mall. It's amazing, <laughs> you know? And this is across the board. This is why I like Riyadh. It's so natural. It's real. Everything happens uh, for a reason there. It's not a bubble. It might be a bubble, but then it has to be a very big bubble. They, like, they love to meet with people that are not from the country. If they knew that, then they will give you more priority. So it's amazing. Like, this is... Um, no, I understand. This is very interesting. So, well, it's been fantastic. Your energy is amazing. Um, one last question. So for people listening to us, and probably two questions. So the first one is for people listening to, to you and to me, what would be the advice you would give them to visit Doha? Of course, I'm sure you'll tell them, go and use my company. I'm sure that's for sure. And it seems like a cool one. But as well, for Doha and for Riyadh or for Qatar and for Saudi. First question. Well, uh, if they're coming for business, then uh, definitely do a lot of market study. It's very, very important because these countries can can be amazing, but at the same time, they can be uh, drainers as well of energy. And if you're going for things to do and spend time, each country offers something different. For me, Doha and Dubai has a little bit of a similar street views, you know, outlook. The both countries are very much Dao, Dao boat related. Like, you know, they have a sea history while Saudi is more desert, you know? So you tend to see a lot of uh, castles, a lot of uh, uh, palm trees, you know, uh, not palm trees, uh, the farms, you know, related to palm and uh, and all that. I think uh, that Saudi is super untouched until now, to be honest, you know, <laughs> you can go anywhere in the desert and find something beautiful. It's it's a oasis. It's a giant oasis of treasures for me. Um, so Dubai is super super touristy. You need maybe two years to to finish all the activities, and that by that you have to do it every day. So it's very very. It's amazing. You have been there, right? You never uh, feel bored in Dubai. You can always you can do things for free, and you can think, you can do things for for money as well. No, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And this is great advice as well. And I think for people listening to us, Thank especially so because Saudi becomes more hype, and there's a lot of stuff for the same with Qatar. So last question. So for as an entrepreneur, and uh, and this touches, of course, you have a wonderful energy. And I love how honest you are. And that passion is key. And as well, you're honest as well, in the sense of your strength is connecting people, creating great things, and you are trying to get professional management to help you on that. That's very important um, uh, awareness, because that shows maturity as well. Um, so what's your goal right now for the two companies? Because uh, uh, I, I believe that what you're building is really very exciting, and especially 365 Adventures and the uh, um Iman Iman Loop. Loop can actually can become really global paras, like you said. So, are you thinking to take this from the angle of Middle East and go worldwide? Um, and very important, this is an interview purely from my passion about traveling and about meeting people. There's no commercial part here, but I'm, I always like to know how you see this going forward and how you grow want to grow your business in the region and outside. So yeah, uh, if you if we have to start with three six five adventures, it's not usually very easy to expand. Okay, you have much 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 bigger companies than I than the three six five adventures, and they are also very limited destinations. The best is to stick close to the the region you are in. So if you're in France, you can go to Germany, you can go to uh, Spain, you can go to maximum Netherlands or Belgium because they are in a close proximity. It's not always good to you know expand to different countries. Then that would remain the goal for three six five adventures. Because even in GCC, you can you can become a giant, you can become a unicorn, you know, in the in the SMEs. You can become a large scale company in that case. Uh, for Imandub, uh, again, it's a very very um, specific content. Uh, uh, um, it's a very specific concept to the region. So I would like to stay in the region because I haven't explored yet. I haven't yet um, explored the potential of the region itself. But if the framework can be applied in different countries, as you said, you know, Africa, which is the youngest uh, youth population 
majority youth population in the world. Why not? Of course, you know, Iman Dub is not just a solution. It's an economy. It can, it can benefit an economy because you're talking about freelancers coming on board, more work being done, more people coming into the country. It's, 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 a, it's a different story. We need maybe another interview just to understand the concept of Iman Dub. Yeah. No, I definitely I will want to, to go for that because one of the things I'm I'm doing and this and that's actually I, I still have one last one, but one of the things that is key for me is definitely the cultural background of people. And I think if you are a global entrepreneur like I am, and if you want to know, and the end of that, like you said, most of Africa and Middle East are the future of the world and Asia. Uh Europe and the US are much becoming much older. And as well, the numbers, the, the numbers we're talking Africa is close to 2 billion people by 2050 or more, uh, which is a huge part of the world population. So uh, last last one. So for people that never went to Qatar, never went to Saudi, what's your uh, motus? Oh, yeah. Well, this is an interesting one. So uh, definitely don't worry uh, about restriction. Don't worry about anything at all. It's just another country in uh, in Europe, Asia, there's no cultural uh, barriers. Yes, uh, it's good to be modest, especially in Riyadh and Doha. Doha, these these two countries promote modesty, you know. But even if you're not, it's not like you're not going to be welcomed in the country. But it's nice to respect culture. If I go to Mexico, I'm going to wear the hat, you know, to support to show support towards for, towards the locals, and they would like it as well. So you should do the same as well. Um, stay very open-minded, you know, um, this is the safest region, probably the safest region in the world. There's, um, no wars here in the, in the countries. There is no thefts. There is no stealing cars. There's no murders. There's, even if there are the very small, you know, it, it happens in such a closed area that you will never get exposed to. It's a dream. Middle East is, I mean, GCC is a dream, by the way. Nothing happen, Nothing wrong takes place in these countries. You know, you have to experience it yourself. It's amazing, you know, that it's home to so many countries, so many different nationalities. The, the, the reason why they're here is not because of money, because of stability. Once it's your family, it's not money. Bachelors come here for money to send money back home. But once you come with your family, it becomes purely about family stability. That's what the GCC countries give you. GCC countries are the six countries, you know. Bahrain, Saudi, UAE, Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar. These six countries, um, you know, these are the ones that are quite amazing in terms of stability. Wow, that's a beautiful, compelling, I would say, invitation. And that part of stability is probably something that most of the people are not conscious of even me. So thank you for that your passion. Um, uh, it's wonderful, Mirage. Congratulations for what you achieved. You're still very young, so I'm sure you're going to, we're you. going to be talking. <laughs> and definitely, I probably will do a next one about the, the um, traveling and uh, technologies around traveling. We didn't touch too much that area, but I know that you guys are doing very cool stuff. Congratulations and talk very yeah. soon. Thank you.